Yeah. This, this all begs the question, if there's different categories and different rules, yeah. and the final determination of categories and question of opinion based on the states, what arbitrator is there for yeah. able to know opinion from five? Yeah. So, there's no arbitrator. Really. The, so the answer is kind of somewhere between the two things you just said. It's not up to the state. So because, let's think of another example. Uganda argued that it was not occupying parts of Congo because it said that it had been invited into the territory pursuant to a treaty, which was true for a period of time, and then they were told to leave. They were told that their forces were no longer wanted on the territory. Of course, it's in Uganda's interest to argue that they're not engaged in armed conflict, right? They, that can be, so we don't leave it to the state to decide. We can always reject a state's own classification of its own behavior because we can say your interest in defining it in a way that benefits you is obvious to us here. Israel saying it's not occupying West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, not particularly important in international law. Now not particularly important in UNICEF terms, in terms of classifying the conflict. However, so it's not up to the state, there's also no one that gets to decide. So somewhere in the middle of that, the answer to the question is, the arbiter is the international community. It's a, it's a deeply unsatisfying answer. The ICRC makes, almost always makes a qualification of armed conflict as soon as the situation starts to change, but they do not generally make their findings public. They don't make their determinations public. Sometimes you could have a court that makes a determination after the fact. So you could have the International Court of Justice or another court say, we think that Bosnia was in a non-international armed conflict at the time that these events occurred, but that's not particularly helpful to us in the moment. I think it often comes down to politically who can, what state is in a position to convince other states to go with their determination. So Iraq, I, I remember talking to a group, I think in Jordan, when the handover of sovereignty occurred and when the U.S. Security Council resolution stated that occupation in Iraq was over. And it was very difficult to convince a group of Iraqis that occupation in Iraq just one day ended in June of 2004. It seemed <coughs> ridiculous because their life experience was that the exact same tanks were rolling down the street, the exact same forces were on the ground. How was it any different? The answer is almost every state in the world got up and agreed to recognize the sovereign government of Iraq. And so at that point, IHL can't still say it's an occupation because the world seems to recognize the, the status of that conflict has changed. So it's very real. It's the real. So especially for Pakistan, for example, or yeah. claiming that it's not so much between the top three categories, but between something short of one conflict, it's yes. a significant absolutely. thing that shouldn't be left to, to the opinion of the states. Yes, absolutely. I think in the case of Pakistan, if it were a different place in a different time without the same actors involved, there is no question that's what happened in Pakistan is not wrong. But yes, they continue to very, very clearly take the line that in no way should it be classified in that manner. By the way, I don't mean to say it's not constantly no question, but at the time, at the height of the fighting in Pakistan, it didn't seem a particularly difficult thing to figure out whether there was sustained enough hostilities to reach the level of armed conflict. But in that case, I would argue, from a UNICEF perspective, even if for policy and political reasons you can't use the word conflict when you're writing a press release or when you're engaging with representatives and liaisons from the military, the rules that derive from IHO if your determination in your country office or with your team is that you're in an armed conflict, then those rules may be powerful nonetheless. But Pakistan, just to continue with the example, it's a very professionalized military. It's very, very plausible that within the Pakistani military, when engaging in specific actions and 
fighting, they are actually using IHL to do so. They understand that politically they can't say anything about it, but they are operating on the basis of IHL, and those humanitarians that are in a position to liaise with them and negotiate with them one-on-one, -on -one, human being to human being, can say, this is the framework we're actually working on. Right. Politically, we can't say that, but we know that that's actually what's going on. Very similar to the U.S. in Iraq in 2003. George Bush and Rumsfeld and everyone else went on the television and said, we are not occupiers, we are liberators. They will greet us with flowers in the streets. I don't remember the rest of the quote. At the exact same time, the U.S. military was rolling out an occupation administration on the territory of Iraq. They were using the Geneva Conventions to determine how to run an occupation, but it was at same of the U.K. But politically, it was not at the time acceptable to say so and engage in that manner. Okay. Um, so let me continue. I'll get the PowerPoint back up. Yes, please. Uh, the status of uh, prisoners in Guantanamo. Guantan yes. Because they come from multiple dimensions and challenges mm -hmm. they operate in a non-state uh, perspective. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, those are the type of things that Al-Qaeda and extremist organizations yes. are very effective to use as their propaganda. Because on the one side, if the non-combatants or the non-state com com competitors or uh, yes. warriors arrest or detain any of the serving soldiers of those states, they are demanding to respect the international treaties, yeah. but at the same time they are not because they do not fall in that category. Yeah, thank you very much for bringing that up, by the way. I, I completely forgot to raise that. It's very important. The other issue, why it's so important to understand the classification of armed conflict, is the status of detainees. So if you are, for example, visiting children held by armed groups, it is extremely important to know whether those children are being held in an international armed conflict. Then they're prisoners of war, and there's a whole list of the rights of child prisoners of war. Then if you're in a non-international armed conflict, in which that set of rules may be somewhat smaller, then in a situation short of hostilities, it's human rights, right? Um, Guantanamo, it's both a complex argument and not a complex argument. So, and it's changed a bit since the Obama administration came into power. So the original argument for Guantanamo was the following. First of all, the main reason, it seems, that Guantanamo is in Guantanamo is that the United States argues, and there are a number of other states that are the same thing, that its human rights obligations and most of its constitutional law obligations are not extraterritorial. They only apply in the territory and jurisdiction of the United States. So, if you have a prison 90 miles, I think it is, off the coast of the southern tip of Florida, it is not in United States territory, and therefore it is not subject to any of the U.S.'s obligations under international law. Second, the argument about Guantanamo was, at the time of the Bush administration, that the individuals who were detained and brought to Guantanamo were, number one, individuals detained in the global war on terror. The global war on terror at the time was not clearly defined as either a non-international or an international armed conflict. And the argument was essentially that this was a new kind of war, right? A new, whoa, paradigm shifting craziness where you couldn't clearly identify what type of conflict was being fought. And thirdly, that the individuals being captured and brought to Guantanamo were not combatants, because they were not members of a state's armed forces, which seems correct, right? That doesn't seem like a particularly controversial argument, unless you believe that the Taliban fighters were the armed forces of Afghanistan. But that they also were not civilians, because they were essentially professional fighters. And at the time, the Bush administration argued they were a new category. Not civilians, not combatants. They unfortunately chose to call them unprivileged belligerents. So they said, you know, they're between these two categories. And the argument was, they are not POWs, so they don't get any of the treatment or rights of POWs, and they're not civilian detainees, so they get none of the protections that civilians would get under human rights. Okay. That situation held for some time, some people were released, there were, of course, many challenges to the decisions around Guantanamo Bay. As you say, I think it was recognized that it had a 
huge security cost. 